it's Keith. I had a request or two to do a demonstration and tutorial on private VLANs, and I'm tickled pink, one of my favorite topics in the entire planet. If we have a service provider, let's you and I play the game of service provider, and we're going to be hosting servers for uh, lots of different companies. Let's take a look at a few. Let's say that we're going to be hosting for Microsoft, and we're going to be hosting for Cisco, and I'll put a C in there, and we're going to be hosting for Apple as well. Okay, so no problem. And as we host these devices, for security purposes, we want to make sure that the Cisco devices don't have direct access to the Microsoft servers. And we don't want to make sure that the Microsoft and Cisco devices don't have direct access to Apple. No problem. What we could do is the service provider could create separate VLANs. So we create one VLAN for all the Microsoft, one VLAN for Cisco, and one VLAN for Apple. So we could have you know 20 servers here, 30 servers here, 40 servers here. No problem. It's easy. But what if we have 100 clients? Do we really want to create a hundred different VLANs? Well, if we do, then we need to go ahead and use IP addressing on those, right? So we could subnet, I suppose, and take IP address blocks and subnet them down. But every time we subnet, we lose IP address space. We lose the all zeros and the all ones broadcast address. And so if we have thousands of clients that we're hosting for, and we're creating thousands of VLANs and thousands of subnets, we're losing tons and tons of IP addressing space. So what's the solution to that? The solution is private VLANs. Check this out. We can create a scenario where we create this little thing called a community VLAN for Microsoft, a different community VLAN, I'll use a different color, for Cisco, and yet a third community VLAN for Apple, and as a result, we can put all those devices in their own respective community VLANs, and all they can talk to is each other. So all the Apple servers can talk to each other in here. All the Cisco devices can talk to each other inside that VLAN. And all the Microsoft devices can talk to each other inside that VLAN. Well, Keith, that's all well and good. However, how does that solve the IP addressing space? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to use the same IP major subnet for the entire, all three of the community VLANs. We can use subnet, for example, 10 slash 24, and we could have everybody use that IP address space, even across the VLANs. So we're going we're gonna to take these logical sub VLANs or secondary VLANs and allow them all to use the same IP addressing space. So maybe we use dot two through 50 here, and we use 51 through 100 here, and we use 101 through 150 here, as far as IP addressing in the 10 space, and we're good. So some of you are looking at this saying, wait a sec, wait a sec, wait a sec. So the goal is to keep these guys from communicating with each other, but at the same time, we're using the same IP address space so we don't have to subnet. How do they get out to the rest of the world? How do they reach a gateway? Good question. We're also going to create an additional VLAN called the primary VLAN. And we're going to put at least one device in that. That's going to be your router. So this primary VLAN, I'll use uh, light blue for him. This primary VLAN is going to have what's called a promiscuous port. And here's the deal. As far as communication goes, Microsoft can communicate within their VLAN as much as they want with each other. And they can communicate back and forth with the primary VLAN, specifically the promiscuous port. The Cisco community VLAN can also communicate with the primary VLAN. So they've got a, a door, if you will, a gateway to get out of their own local little space to the rest of the real world. And Apple also has access to communicate with the primary VLAN. So the primary VLAN is simply a bi-directional communication mechanism that each sub VLAN, each secondary VLAN, can use to communicate with the outside world. So the Microsoft, Cisco, and Apple are all isolated from each other, yet they can all speak to the primary VLAN. And that's what primary VLAN's primary job is. Now there's one other element. Maybe you have the onesie twosies. Maybe you have 10 or 15 or 200 different clients that have one server or two servers, and you don't want any of those to talk to each other. There's additional an additional secondary VLAN that's called the isolated VLAN. 
And this isolated VLAN is unique in that no one in the isolated VLAN can talk to each other. So if I have 15 different servers, I'll just draw a few. I'll put four in there. So if I have four different servers in the isolated VLAN, they can't talk to each other even inside the isolated VLAN. It's like glue that has bolted them to the floor. And even though a server is right next door, a member of that same isolated VLAN, they won't be able to communicate with each other. And that's how it operates. So let's do a review here. Microsoft, in a community secondary VLAN, can talk to other devices if a server in that VLAN can talk to other devices in that same community and to the primary VLAN for the default gateway to get out of the service provider's network. Cisco can talk to other devices inside their own community secondary VLAN and also to the primary VLAN. Apple, in their community VLAN, can talk to other devices in that same community VLAN and also to the primary VLAN for the gateway to get out of the service provider out to the real world. The isolated VLAN, each of those devices in the isolated VLAN, they can chat and communicate with the primary VLAN and that's it. So there's no communication. Actually, red might even be a better color. So there's no communication between two devices that are sitting in the same isolated VLAN. So how many VLANs are we talking about here? I mean, I thought it was private VLAN, not private VLANs. Guess what? It's actually multiple VLANs parading as one logical broadcast domain, but choosing who can talk to each other. So there's no communication between two different community VLANs. And the VLANs that are involved, you're always going to have at least one primary VLAN that's going to have at least one router in it as a promiscuous port so the rest of the world can get out. You're going to have at least, well, you don't have to have any community VLANs, but most people have at least one community VLAN for each company that has two or more servers. And then an isolated VLAN, and you only need one of those. One isolated VLAN, you can go ahead and put hundreds of devices in it. There's no need for two or three different isolated VLANs because one isolated VLAN doesn't allow communication between the various devices. And that's it. That's how private VLANs operate. Now, what about configuration, configuring a private VLAN? I've got a demo for you. You're going to love it. Let's take a look at the topology of what we're going to configure, and then we'll lab it up, and then we'll test it. In this demo that we're about to go through together, we're going to configure a primary VLAN and we're going to put one interface on the switch into it. So R1 is connected to FA01 and the green VLAN or VLAN 10 will be the primary VLAN that everybody can communicate with. So R1 is going to be our guide to get out to the rest of the world. We'll create this yellow one right here, VLAN 20. That will be our community VLAN. Now, if I have 10 different customers and they each have several servers each, I might create several community VLANs, one per customer. In this case, I'll create one community VLAN. If you want to create more, the syntax is identical. You simply create additional VLAN and use the same syntax that you'll see. And we'll assign FA0 slash 3, that interface, to that VLAN. And R3 is going to play the role of a server inside that VLAN. And then we'll create the one isolated VLAN here in red. That'll be VLAN 30. And we'll have R5 connected to FA05 on the switch port. And we'll configure that switch port to be a member of the isolated. So as an end result, we're going to use the 10.0.0.0 address space. And we'll use .1 on R1, .3 on R3, .5 on R5. And what's going to happen is that R1 will be able to communicate with R3 and R5, no problem because R1 is the promiscuous port in the primary VLAN, but R3 will only be able to talk to R1. If R3 had other buddies in that same community VLAN, it could talk to those as well, but I don't have any at the moment. And R5, because it's in the isolated VLAN, it will only be able to talk to R1, no matter how many additional devices we added to the isolated VLAN, R5 would only be able to talk to R1. That's the game plan. Let me walk you through the syntax. As I configure it, I'll tell you what each of the commands does. Here we are sitting at switch one. We have the physical connectivity to each of the devices. If we do a show CDP neighbor, just want to verify that we have the connections we believe we have. So switch one is connected to R3 on its local FA03. It's connected to R1 on local FA01 and R5 on local FA0 slash 5. So that's all perfect. Let's get to configuring. 
The first thing we're going to do is make sure that the VTP mode is transparent. If it is already, that's great, but you do need to use transparent mode to configure private VLANs. Then we're creating uh, VLAN 10. We're saying it's private VLAN primary, and we're also associating it with 20 and 30, which will be our secondary VLANs. So all we've done is we have a new VLAN. It's the primary. Its associations are with the two secondary VLANs, the community and the isolated. We create the community VLAN 20, the isolated VLAN 30, and now they exist and they have their roles. Then on interface FA01, which is going to R1, we want him to be the promiscuous port in the primary VLAN. So we say switch port mode, private VLAN promiscuous, and then we do a mapping that says, okay, the primary VLAN is 10 and the secondary VLANs are 20 and 30. That way that port knows it's allowed to communicate with those other two VLANs. Then on FA03, which is for our community VLAN, which is R3 is a part of, we say private VLAN host and private VLAN host association 10 space 20. That means the primary VLAN is 10 and this VLAN is 20. And that's how it knows where it belongs in the hierarchy. It allows this guy to go ahead and talk to anybody else in that same community. And then finally, FA0 slash 5 is going to be our isolated port. Syntax is very similar, except we're associating that port now with the primary VLAN of 10 and the secondary VLAN of 30. And if you look up top, the isolated VLAN of 30, it knows it's an isolated VLAN because we told it in VLAN configuration mode. You might want to roll this back and play it a couple times, but that's it. That's it. If we wanted to create additional ports in the uh, community VLAN, we simply do this syntax right here over and over. So if we wanted ports five or port seven and nine and ten and fifteen all to be a member of the community VLAN, we'd repeat this. If we wanted to add additional ports to the isolated VLAN, we would repeat this one. That's it. All we have to do now is test it. So if we go to R1 and verify our IP addresses. Show IP interface brief. I've got 10.0.0.1 on that interface. Look at that. I can't triple click. There we go. So if I did a ping to 10.0.0.255 and I said a repeat count of 1, that broadcast ping to the 10 network should be able to be responded to by R3 and R5. R3 in the community VLAN, R5 in the isolated VLAN, they both have access to the primary VLAN promiscuous port. So there's our ping. Let's see who responds. There we go, just like we expected. R5 responded and R3 responded. Let's go to R3. R3 is in the community VLAN. He's all by himself. If he had other people in the community VLAN, they'd be able to talk to him too. But as a result of him being alone, he can talk to everybody else in the community VLAN, which is nobody, and the promiscuous port in VLAN 10, the primary VLAN. So we'll do a ping. And we'll see who responds. I'm expecting only R1. So far, so good. Let's go check out R5. He's in the isolated VLAN. If we had a 1,000 devices in the isolated VLAN, they would only be able to talk to the primary VLAN and nobody else in the isolated VLAN. So the same syntax. We'll repeat that one time. And we should only get a response from R1. And there we have it. So it works. It, the purpose of private VLANs probably helps most of all when you think of why we're doing this. We here have three devices, R1, R3, and R5. They all exist in different logical VLANs, but because the entire group is considered a private VLAN, they can all communicate based on the rules. Primaries can talk to everybody. The community VLANs can communicate to other devices in that same community VLAN plus the primary and isolated devices. Anybody in the isolated VLAN can talk to no one except for a device in the primary VLAN, which is going to be our primary gateway to get out to the world. So thanks for watching. I appreciate the request and have a fabulous, fabulous rest of the day. Thanks, everybody.